Hello, it's the AEMT Lecture Series. Welcome back. This will be video number one for Chapter 35, OB. And so this is a review for you guys. Um, you're already basic EMTs, and you're familiar with this chapter. Um, if not, you need to review it. Um, a lot of the AEMT tests will be just that of reviewing questions that you've already saw. So let's just kind of, I want to, hang on one second, I want to just kind of hit the high points here. And let's talk about gestation um, and what gestation is. Uh, it refers to the process of fetal development following the fertilization of the egg. Okay, and so um, the egg um, gets fertilized in the fallopian tube, and we're going to look at that real quick. I'm trying not to bore you too much with this, um, but here, here's your fallopian tube, and, um, and let me grab my pen here. Ah, here we go. Here's your fallopian tube. Oh, man. Sorry, guys. Okay. I did select the pen. I'm not quite sure. Oh, hang on. Let me try something else. Ooh, got a little laser pointer there. All right. All right. So starting over here. Here is the um, your ovaries here. And here are the eggs. They're coming out into the fallopian tube where they meet up with the sperm. This is in eighth grade. You guys should already have that. But this is where those tubular pregnancies can happen, right here in the fallopian tube. Uh, if for some reason, if that egg gets uh, caught up in the fallopian tube, it uh, can be a big problem, right? And so then where we want it to go, it's right down here somewhere, you know, in the uh, uterus right here along the endometrial wall. And that's ideal. That's what you kind of want. Okay. And so remember though, <clears throat> this egg that's fertilized, it's only, I mean, we're in the fallopian tube. Think about it. So it's this is not going to be a 34th week of pregnancy type occurrence. So you're going to see this in the first eight weeks. So remember that. Sudden onset of abdominal pain, female, childbearing age, uh, or they know they're pregnant, they just had a pregnancy test done, they're six weeks pregnant, something like that. That's the kind of setup you're going to get for atopic pregnancies. All right, and 40 weeks of labor divided into three trimesters. Okay, and this slide kind of represents that. Um, it talks about the umbilical cord here connects the placenta to the fetus, right? And remember, um, when we were talking about abrupto placenta, that short umbilical cord type uh, was one of the risk factors. But um, that's how that works okay so I kind of wanted to hit, hit on that a little bit um, gestation period is the time it takes uh, the infant to develop in the in uh, utero okay that's your gestation period um like I said, 40 weeks of pregnancy, three trimesters, fetal heart tones can normally be audible around the 17th through the 20th week. It's just FYI, not really FYI, I'm not telling you that because it's on the exam. It's just good information in case um, it comes up later. Okay, stand by. Spontaneous, excuse me, 
a spontaneous abortion, like a, a.k.a. miscarriage. Okay, she's usually going to see first trimester. Okay. We talked about ectopic a minute ago. All right, so any time uh, this happens outside the uterus, most of the time, 97%, 97% of the time, you're going to see this like in the fallopian tube. Okay, lower abdominal pain and cramping can be, it, you know, it is life-threatening emergency. All right, third trimester bleeding. Okay, so two things we're worried about. Um, I'm thinking abrupt placenta, and I'm thinking placenta previa are, are two things, right, that we would see in those later onset of pregnancy. Um, vaginal bleeding, okay. We know that placenta previa, uh, darker type of, uh, of uh, described as a darker blood and abrupto described as bright red blood all right let's talk about the blood pressure thing um, chronic hypertension okay uh, it's defined right there, 130 over 80. If your diastolic pressure is higher than 110 millimeters of mercury, uh, the patient has, of course, an increased chance of stroke. Then we talk about gestational hypertension. We're looking at the, and that's kind of important, the 20th week of pregnancy. Okay, and we worry about this because of preeclampsia. All right, what separates preeclampsia from eclampsia? That's going to be the development of seizures. If seizures occur, then the patient has become eclamptic. Uh, preeclampsia is accompanied, okay, by a certain type of protein that's released in the urine. We're going to have swelling, and I like to call it flash swelling. Okay, you're going to you're going to have that uh, sudden onset of that weight, uh, reported sudden onset of weight gain. Headache is, a, is a, one of the big complaints in this. Uh, nausea, vomiting. Okay, then if, uh, of course, if the patient has a seizure, now they become eclamptic. And then we have the supine hypotension syndrome. This is the opposite, right? Because I said hypotension, supine hypotension, right? And so this is where uh, the baby actually falls or is, is in a certain position to where it's covering the aorta. And if it's pr putting pressure on the aorta, we have a loss of blood supply bringing upon that hypotension Um, we usually see this when the patient has been put on a backboard and is immobilized. That's the reason why we tell you if the patient requires immobilization to tilt the patient up to you know their left side. That will allow the fetus to move you know a little bit and it will actually come off of that aorta. And so I could see that scenario working two different ways. I could see a scenario where patients involved in motor vehicle motor vehicle can, uh, collision, and that would give you driver restrained, a loss of consciousness, patient complains of whatever, and they may say slow speed motor vehicle collision to maybe help you out there a little bit to say, okay, well the mechanism doesn't meet this patient having a blood pressure of 84 over 40. So that's the thing you should start thinking about then. Oh, okay, well, what would cause hypotension in a pregnant female? <clears throat> Supine hypotension syndrome would. Let me fix that. And the fix is to simply 
tilting the backboard up a little bit to where the fetus can slide off of the aorta. Okay, wait one sec. Let me look at the next ones. Whoops, gestational diabetes. Let's talk about that for a second. So this is uh, the mother's inability to process those carbohydrates that, that turn to uh, turn into sugar. Carbohydrates usually turn into sugar. Um, they may be asymptomatic and ex uh, exhibit the same signs observed in patients with diabetes. Okay, they may have uh, excessive urination. They may have thirst and that sort of thing. Hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of times these patients can be put on diet control and um, maybe some oral hypoglyc hypoglycemic type meds to fix that problem. <clears throat> um, and that's so, you know, that's, that's why it's important in all your pregnant female patients to get a blood sugar. And let's see if it's their conditions related to diabetes. Now, they may have never had a history of diabetes. Okay. They may not have, and that's the reason why we call it gestational diabetes, um, because they don't have to fit in that, uh, have a history of diabetes to have this. Hyperemesis, um, in, uh, uh, if I can pronounce it right, gravidar gravidarum, I can't say it, I'm sorry guys. <clears throat> anyway, though, uh, this is your morning sickness, okay? Uh, these are your folks that just, and it's, you know, I say morning sickness, but this is some really, some really bad morning sickness, okay? Um, prolonged vomiting results in dehydration and malnutrition. Um, this could be caused from uh, the hormones that are being, you know, uh, hormone levels that are, you know, trying to support the baby. Stress. Um, but these patients need IV fluids. Okay, and then the premature rupture of the membranes, meaning the patient is in, um, pregnant and the water breaks and it's not time for the baby. Okay, so... Um, there's nothing that we can do from that other than transport, you know, get them to the hospital. So they, they do have drugs that can try to slow down that process and you know, it can be evaluated uh, to see how, how they're going to do that. Let's talk about complications of labor. Okay, so the definitive treatment for these patients is, you know, a lot of times it's a cesarean, all right, a C-section. Um, and we have to remember that. So labor that begins after the 20th week of gestation, uh, but, but before the 37th week is considered preterm. And that's important to know. Twenty labor that begins uh, after the twentieth week of gestation, but before the thirty seventh week is considered premature. And of course, the treatment is prevent the labor. That's 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 the goal here is to prevent labor, um, preterm labor. So. Um, a lot of times they, they kind of think that preterm labor can be brought on by the patient um, being dehydrated. So let's go ahead and start an IV. Let's give a, flu a fluid bolus. Okay, let's do that. We'll expect a child that, of course, is smaller and thinner than a full-term full newborn. 
Um, we're going to treat that patient accordingly to how they present. Um, we're going to manage the airway, provide oxygen, right? And then we have fetal distress, and I would know this too. So what are some things that can cause fetal distress? You know, conditions that makes you know that may cause fetal distress. Well, we have hypoxia, the nuchal cord, right? Nuchal cord, the, the umbilical cord around the neck, right? Abrupt placenta would be one, and a prolapsed cord. A meconium stained delivery. Okay, so it's that we're fixing to deliver the baby, and all of a sudden we have that yellow tinted amniotic fluid. Okay, and that's going to suggest to us that you know we're dealing with a meconium type of delivery. Okay, and the more yellow to green to black, um, the worse the danger is going to be. And so what we should expect then is to have to do some suctioning and possibly deep suctioning. M most of the time, I don't know what that was, it beeped. But anyway, most of the time, you know, this is a basic, uh, deliveries are basic, right? Um, but if you see this, go ahead and get an ALS unit en route or a paramedic unit en route in case the patient has to be, you know, deep suction where, you know, we have to actually uh, go into the lungs and, and suction. All right, multiple gestations, multiple patients, very, very um, high risk call. Okay, uh, anytime you have um, multiple births, you're increasing complications of pregnancy. Um, so if you get there and you find out one that this is going to be you know more than one baby, go ahead and start another unit right then because you're going to need you're going to need two ambulances. You're going to need the people because when baby number one comes out, followed by baby number two, if both of, imagine if both of these kids need to be resuscitated and the amount of resources that you're going to need. What if baby one's very sick, baby two is okay, and mama takes a turn for the worse. So you need to have you know, more people, hopefully, than you're going to use. All right, so big deal on resources there. All right, so and every delivery, regardless of of uh, one birth or two births, etc. These babies need to be warm. And you can't get them warm enough. I've tried. I in, in the summertime, I put them in the back of the ambulance and not turn the air on, and it'll be hot. Mom's sweating. I'm sweating, and we still get there, and the kid's hypothermic. So, um, you're going to be on the scene if you have multiple deliveries a lot longer than you anticipated. So, we've really got to warm these kids up. That's a amniotic fluid embolism is extremely rare. A breach presentation, okay. Um, most babies are born head first, face down. Um, so there's different types of breach presentations. You already know this. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go there. Um, but you need to know what the treatments are for that. And we're and know that we're not doing a field delivery with a breach like this one right here, with a leg sticking out. Uh, we're going to the hospital. So 
So, you know, know your breach deliveries. Um... I'm not going to cover neonatal resuscitation. You've already had it. You know it. If you don't, relearn it. If you have questions, call me. Be glad to go over it with you. Um, I'm just trying to cover the stuff that um, you that you don't know yet that you need to know. Uh, because if I do a whole lecture on this whole chapter that has 121 slides, I'm not going to keep you guys there. You're going to turn me off, um, and the ones who need the information are never going to get it. So this is what I have for you. Um, I put a test five review sheet up on uh, up today. It's a um, Google Doc, and the cool thing about that is is everybody can work on it together. So not everybody has to answer all those questions. You know, that way maybe. Maybe you guys get together and you know divvy those questions out, but it allows you two guys to collaborate and talk about things and and you know and have an idea of what what your you know what's going to be expected of you on the exam. All right, I will see you guys next time with the next lecture.